Okay. Let's see if it's working. Yes, it's working now. The people in Italy did not call this a Renaissance. Renaissance uh, is French, is a French term, and it's what modern historians have applied to uh, this period that uh, begins sometime in the 14th century, middle of the 14th century, I guess, and um, sort of lasts into what art historians refer to as the Baroque period. Um, now, it's a profound transformation. And it affects cities, as we might expect, when we have a complete sort of political, social, and economic reorganization of the world, um, you can expect that it's going to have an effect upon cities. And that is certainly the case, um, certainly the case in the Renaissance. Um, but the question today, and again, something that I want not to hold you entirely responsible for, but rather to sort of try to paint for you a picture of the world as it emerges out of uh, the medieval world and transforms itself into something that begins to resemble uh, the modern world. I want to begin by um, talking, in fact, about a book that I read about a year ago I highly recommend called The Swerve. It's written by uh, a man named Greenblatt. I believe his name is Harvey or Henry Greenblatt who's a professor of English at Harvard. And uh, I'm not sure how he got interested in this, but um, it's been well known for a long time. In fact, I've mentioned it in previous lectures, that what we have today, for example, as Vitruvius is actually stitched together. It's stitched together from texts that had resided in the Arabic world, Islamic world, uh, things that resided in monasteries, in some cases, off the coast of Ireland. Uh, where they were pretty far removed from Rome and the seat of the Western Church, and therefore um, they preserved a lot of things like Frontinus, the uh, water commissioner, so that, you know, that ev everybody else were thrown out. Um, and what happened then over this thousand-year period between the classical world and the which I guess is supposed to mean the rebirth of classicism, it is not, um, in, in it rather is the uh, birth of the modern world um, that actually is based upon uh, this passion for trying to uncover uh, this fragmentary past that was under their feet. It was all around them. It was still embedded in the walls of their buildings and was sitting in dusty shelves in some monastery somewhere in Switzerland or somewhere in Turkey or somewhere in Egypt, right? Um, and... Uh, the, so what survived is just sort of random. I mean, that's the only way to describe it. But I think the, the, um, the passion with which, uh, beginning in the late 14th century, the passion with which these people in Italy began to um, attempt to recover uh, the past, to learn more about um, this classical world, what Alberti calls this vast shipwreck, is perhaps um, best understood through the story of uh, this one man who had been a papal secretary. Who He rose to that position because he had very good handwriting. And in days before the printing press, being able to copy something um, legibly and neatly uh, was a prized thing. And so he became uh, the secretary to uh, a pope who became known as the anti-pope. He was actually put on trial for all sorts of misdeeds. And um, ultimately, they had for a period two popes. But anyway, the secretary found himself out of a job. And so um, to employ himself... Uh, there was a demand for copies of ancient texts, and he became a book hunter, hunting these manuscripts. Now, what he found is interesting, because uh, there was no known copy of it anywhere. He found the only copy that, as far, that has ever been found of a long poem written by a Roman author named Lucretius. Uh, Lucretius was a follower of the Greek philosopher uh, Epicurus. And today, when we use this term um, Epicurean, typically it means uh, that you like to eat a lot, drink a lot, sort of live a fat and happy life. Um, 
But, but Epicurus actually had put out there, now how he came up with this baffles me, that um, no matter can be created or destroyed. That what always was, always is, and always will be, except in a different form. You, the chair, the room, the street, the car, is all comprised of these tiny invisible things called atoms. Now, he didn't call them that, but Lucretius was a follower of Epicurus, and he wrote this long poem in which he uh, posited, in fact, after he had made all the obligatory dedications to all the gods and so forth, um, that, in fact, um, these atoms actually simply rearrange themselves into different forms so that at certain periods of time they were trees, at certain periods of time they were sheep, at certain periods of time it was a piece of chalk, right? In certain, certain conditions it comes together as a human being. Um, this, <laughs> this is an astonishing thing, and obviously it is something that uh, the church, the implication of that was something that the Roman church uh, was not too happy about, right? Uh, so here we have this uh, why, because it sort of suggests that, in fact, maybe there was not uh, this creator God in the same way that um, the church had posited that, right? Uh, at least it has that implication. Well, so here we have this unemployed papal secretary who is rummaging around all over the place, and he stumbles upon this one copy of, of uh, what it translates into English is On the Nature of Things, this poem by Lucretius. And um, it, there's a copy made of it. And all I can tell you is that on the day he died, Thomas Jefferson had five copies of this poem in his personal library, this long poem, right? It influenced everything that came after it. The notion of scientific experimentation, of um, sort of objective analysis, of empirical evidence. All of these things really come from um, the interpretations of this ancient poem by Lucretius. Now, the reason I'm telling this story is because the only way that the unemployed papal secretary could have made a living doing this is if there had been a substantial market for such texts, right? And the question is, who's buying them? Well, clearly the church isn't going to buy something which undermines. In fact, uh, a man named uh, Giordino Bruno, who was a follower of Epicurus and a monk, was burned at the stake, and his statue stands uh, in the Campo dei Fiori in Rome today uh, because he was convicted of heresy, right? So um, this was not something, but who would have, where would the market have come from? Anybody? Merchant princes. Well, who are these merchant princes? Well, as trade began to develop, um, you began to get the rise of these trade associations, which ultimately became very powerful and were able, in fact, to enter into contracts independent from a feudal lord or independent from the church. We talked about the Masons as being those who had a particular kind of skill that was valuable to the church, for example. And so ultimately, the guild of the Masons was able to kind of wrest control of their own skill away from these traditional forms of authority. And so uh, over time, in the 12th, 13th, and 14th centuries, you began to get the rise of, um, of these uh, trade associations, or the rise of the power of these trade associations. In fact, the Medici who formed a huge bank, which we'll get into in a moment, uh, in Florence, the Medici family actually rose to power through uh, the control of the uh, wool trade. They were actually the, the wool merchants' guild um, in the 1400s. And then uh, a bank, they formed a bank. Well, now, what is the significance of the bank? Well, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes war, you know, World War II was a horrible thing, but it gave us penicillin, for example, which came from cheese mold, of all things, right? Um, and uh, sometimes uh, war has a way of actually having beneficial outcomes that are not immediately apparent. I mentioned the 
misbegotten notion that um, primarily from France, but also England, other places, trying to go and sort of uh, clear the way to the Holy Land, to Jerusalem, uh, and the creation of these crusades, that is, in the name of the cross, um, that they would actually then take control of this and wrest it away from um, the Islamic powers that control it. In this case, it was Egypt. And um, so that these Christians could make pilgrimages to Jerusalem, right? Uh, which they couldn't do for a long period of time. And so um, a group of people, uh, actually there were two brothers in France, nine of them originally, eight of whom are known, formed something called the Knights of the Temple. And they were sort of warrior monks, swore vows of poverty, chastity, so on and so forth. And then they provided a kind of escort during this period, these periods, where they would escort people back and forth, sort of like a bodyguard, so that if a pope needed to go meet with um, um, the archbishop in Constantinople, they would provide safe passage. Sooner or later, they became so trusted that, um, and you had to send ships, and you had to send money, and you had to do all these things to fund all of this. And so people in, let's say, uh, Spain began to deposit money with the Templars, right, which then the Templars uh, would make good on once uh, at the other end of the journey. Now, this is taken from old Roman trade systems, right? That you actually um, uh, would loan someone the money to produce the crop, and they would pay you back with interest. And then um, uh, you would actually then sell that to a merchant who would then perhaps borrow the money um, and, and so on and so forth. But you wouldn't carry the money with you. It was too dangerous, right? You don't get on an airplane with $100,000 in cash in your pocket right, or in your suitcase, right? You have something like what? American Express traveler's checks or a credit card, just another form of that, where, in fact, you have deposited money in a bank in Atlanta, but if you are in Shanghai, you can use an ATM and withdraw that money, right? The Templars more or less invented that. Well, where did they get the idea? Well, <laughs> this is really amazing. Uh, true story. I was in Salisbury, um, and with my wife on vacation three years ago. And in Salisbury Cathedral, they actually, in the complex there, they had um, the old chapter house, they had an exhibition on the Magna Carta. And it was written in this beautiful script about six-point font, Latin, so I couldn't read it. Even if I could read Latin, I could read a little bit. I couldn't read it because of my eyes. So they had this English translation, and I got a copy of the English translation, and I'm reading it, and in the original Magna Carta, there were two whole paragraphs that stipulated that none of these kinds of laws applied to the Jews. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I mean, my understanding of history is Jews were persecuted throughout the Middle Ages. So why are the Jews exempt from this? Aha, so I looked it up. Well, it turns out that at this point in time, in 1215, Christians could not loan money um, and charge interest to other Christians, right? Muslims could not loan money and charge interest to other Muslims. Hmm? So who could they depend upon to loan the money? The Jews. So the Jews actually were exempt from a number of these rules and laws because of that. Where did the Templars get this idea? They kind of took it over from them. All right. Who took it over from the Templars? The Templars ultimately are dissolved after about 200 years. There's still conspiracy, you know, nuts out there who believe that, you know, the pyramids were built by people from outer space and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> and um, still believe the Templars are around. But the Templars were eventually dissolved uh, because who got the idea, who said, oh, this is a pretty good idea, this sort of banking system, these trade guilds. And so if the trade guilds could establish banks, what they could do is then fund the people who were associated with their guild, and you could increase um, on both ends, both on the production side and on the market side, you could actually increase uh, your, um, 
your uh, production, increase your buying capacity, increase your revenue. And so banking really develops out of this out of this system. And the people who are actually buying these ancient texts are those people who are the heads of these banks and the heads of these trade associations, right, who are no longer, because of their amassing of enormous wealth, under the direct control of, um, of traditional forms of authority, such as the church. Now, that is, or the king, that is um, a um, very, very sketchy, and um, I'm sure there are probably people who know more about this, maybe even in this room or in this building, who, if they heard me state it this way, would say that's entirely wrong. But that's my best understanding of it. And I wanted to try to paint this picture for you because I think it's, we can't just sort of say all of a sudden, out of nowhere, comes uh, these ideas of straight streets and monuments and all these sort of ideas from the classical world that suddenly reappear because suddenly people woke up one morning and said, hey, hey, you know, um, let's remake Rome. You know, no, that doesn't happen like that. It, it really um, happened over uh, a fairly long period of time. Now, it's important to understand that what we really know about the medieval city uh, really dates only from about 1,000 to 1,300 um, of the Common Era. I've st said that earlier, but it's important to understand that. And this, this Dark Age, this period between about the 6th and uh, 6th century, about 400 years, four or 500 years, there's no... There's very little evidence of anything of this world blown and atomized into a million fragments. Um, and really what this period from 1300 on, as these trade associations grow in wealth, um, and you begin to get, with the Templars, you begin to get something that's actually sort of, it's international, right? It's international. Um, and in fact, they have dispensation from the Pope. This is before the Reformation when the Roman church is in the West is still a solid body, so to speak. Um, and so the Pope gives them special dispensation where they don't even have to pay taxes. They were just simply too useful for everybody. Now, <clears throat> footnote to that. There is in Sicily, um, beginning in the early part of the 12th century, this very strange kingdom that appears. Now, think about the geography for a moment and think about where Sicily is. It's in the middle of the Mediterranean. Right? This is what Rome and Carthage were fighting over. Right in the middle of the Mediterranean, an island. And it's conquered by the Normans. Um, in fact, the first cousin of William the Conqueror who had conquered England. In fact, the Normans were Vikings, Northmen, who had settled in the northern coast of France and then who, by about 1100, began to spread out and conquer territory. They conquered um, Sicily. And they established, it lasted for 200 years, uh, this very strange hybrid kingdom um, in Sicily. And Sicily was like the uh, Swiss during World War II, officially neutral, and everybody needed them as go-betweens. Where did you deposit all of the money that you had looted if you were a Nazi, that you had looted all? Swiss banks, right? Um, so the Swiss were neutral because you needed go-betweens. And Sicily became, in this period of these crusades, of these wars, um, became the sort of Switzerland of this period. And it is through S Sicily that a lot of the, this, this sort of hybridization, this kind of fusion, um, the official language of the court is what? Arabic. Who were the people who conquered? Northmen, Normans, um, very strange. Even their architecture is strange because you'll have sort of Islamic elements that are mixed in with sort of Frankish elements that are mixed in with other things. Very, very strange. But it was through Sicily that um, you begin to get things like Arabic enumeration, which is actually from India, um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, as opposed to Roman numeral 1, 2, 3, 4, so forth, right? Um, higher mathematics, algebra, trigonometry, which is entirely created in the Muslim world. I think the most useful math for architects out there. Um, and it is through Sicily coming into the port of Pisa that we begin to get um, a lot of the flow of this material. Okay. <clears throat> 
So we have then this turmoil, and um, whereas in the Middle Ages the economy had been entirely dependent upon the control of and the ownership of land, what you could grow on it, what you could dig out of it, what you could defend, and thus we see these fortified things. In the period of 1300 to 1400, with the emergence of these guilds and banking, we begin to get away an urban economy that can begin to divorce itself away from the control and ownership of land. The Templars didn't own any land, right? Yet they became fabulously wealthy because they were loaning people money um, on both sides of the conflict, loaning people money and then being repaid with interest. All right, and people were depositing um, substantial sums of money, substantial amounts of wealth in the banks that the Templars created so that they could withdraw it when they arrived at wherever they were going at the other end. Whether they were fighting a war, whether it was their soldiers, or whether they were wool merchants who were actually um, needed the money to buy the wool when they got to wherever it was the sheep were living, um, etc. So. This, um, I hope, paints a little bit of uh, a picture of this world. So the Medici, for example, rise to power in Florence through the acquisition of the war debt that England had defaulted on. They bought, England went bankrupt, the King of England went bankrupt, and for a period of time he actually owed an oath of fealty to um, Cosimo de' Medici, right? And... Um, they bought that debt at something like today what would be, say, 60 cents on the dollar and uh, in the end um, made a tremendous amount of money on it, and that built up this bank. Um, so Italy in particular, going back to the books and this, this, um, this desire by these merchant princes to um, acquire this knowledge, the, um, these people never identified with the Frankish, Germanic, and Anglo-Saxon Gothic worlds. For them, it was crude and barbaric, and rather they turned their attention to the south and to the east, to the repositories of what Alberti had referred to, writing in the early part of the 1400s, as the vast shipwreck of the classical world, separated by a thousand years and with incomplete knowledge based on misunderstood fragmentary evidence about which they knew very little. There were two impulses that I want to talk about today. The first is uh, the desire then to reform governments into what they called republics. They, don't, they wouldn't resemble what we would call republics today, but um, in some cases, Siena is an example, they actually formed a republic. Um, in Florence, even though they had a republic, it was a shell and was really controlled by the Pazzis and by the Medici. Um, in the north, in Milan, and so forth, the Sforzas, the Genoa, this, you know, on and on. So um, the first was then the um, desire to edify, a good old-fashioned word, to make visible some form of a political space that symbolized this reformation of the state. And two lectures from now, one of them is titled The State as a Work of Art, because it's an attempt to try to reconceive of the city as something which actually is appropriate for this sort of new condition that they found themselves in, new economically and new politically. Um, the second, then, so the parvi um, is transformed in a sense into the piazza, in some cases, which means public place, um, into something associated with the new institution, City Hall, which is actually, in Venice, for example, controlled by the guilds, controlled by the associations, uh, with a duke called a doge who was elected, but in Florence, um, in, in Siena, for example, was actually a council of nine that was actually uh, representing the three villages, as we'll see, that had grown together. So this desire to create political space um, and a city hall, something which was symbolic of the unification of the city as a whole, and then the second, uh, the villa, uh, 
We haven't talked about villas, but uh, the villa is a very interesting building type, and I want to spend, even if we don't get through all the slides today, I want to spend a few moments talking about this. Um, the villa is a Roman thing. Uh, it comes from there, like so much. Uh, and the question is, what is it? Well, it's a farmhouse. But if you had a whole lot of money, um, you had um, a villa which looked like a farm. Um, it may actually have had some cows and some sheep. Maybe you grew grapes and olives. Maybe you did some other things, but that was not the purpose of it. It was not to derive income uh, from the land. It was, in fact, um, to achieve something that the Romans called otium, O-T-I-U-M. That might be on a test. That might be the only thing that's on the test here. Otium. What was otium? Otium was um, best be described as productive leisure. Now, um, for me, leisure means I don't have to grade any papers. I don't have to prepare a lecture. I can lie on the couch and watch a football game, even though my wife thinks that my time would be much better served and humanity would benefit from me going out and pruning the hedge. Uh, fortunately, Saturday it was raining, and so I didn't have to do that. Um, to me, it's just kind of lying around, right, not having to do anything. But for uh, in the Roman mind, otium was something a little different. It was actually productive leisure. Productive leisure means that I'm not just lying around on the couch, but that I'm actively engaged in something that is unrelated to my work, but is perhaps in the end more profound. Writing poetry, reading, uh, teaching myself another language, um, taking a course on Coursera, um, doing something which is somehow trying to improve myself. It might even include climbing a mountain or something which um, makes me physically fit as well as um, satisfies the soul, so to speak, right? The opposite of otium in Latin is negotium, neg, negative otium, negotium, which is where our word negotiate comes from. It was their word for business, okay? So the villa becomes important because it has no, it is the product of an urban economy, and it has no actual program. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, I mean that if you are building a hospital, then you have to build a hospital, right? It has to perform certain duties as a hospital. If you're building a school, it has to have classrooms, has to have cafeteria, has to have a playground, has to have principal's office, has to all have all these things. Well, what would a villa have to have? Clean air, clean water, a few sheep in the meadow, you might even occasionally eat the sheep, but it's more likely that they have names. You follow me? It's, uh, it's, it's about the pleasure, and it's driven by this wealthy client. So Hadrian's villa is um, something which is really about his withdrawal from Rome itself in order to achieve this sense of otium. Horace's Sabine farm, same thing. Villas were ubiquitous in the Roman world, and, of course, in the Middle Ages, they fell away completely. Only to return when who starts building them again? Anybody? These merchant princes. The Medici probably built 15 or 20 of them. Well, why is this important? Well, it's important architecturally because it means you can experiment with it because a villa, by definition, is aggressively modern. In fact, that's the term that the Renaissance scholars used for themselves, modern, right? Um, it meant that you could experiment with all sorts of things that were not possible to sort of go in here somewhere in Midtown and build because I'm now outside the city, I have a wealthy client, we can experiment with these things. I like to think of them as race cars, right? Race cars. NASCAR is a pretty crazy thing, I think. You know, you spend, you have a car, an automobile that costs a million and a half dollars, and somebody gets in it and drives it around in a circle for 500 miles, and uh, a few people crash along the way, and there goes your million dollars. And um, why would you do that? Why would Ford or anybody else be interested in racing cars? Well, think about the things that came out of racing automobiles, right? Radial tires, rear view mirrors seat belts, 
monocoque construction, roll bars. Cars became more efficient, fuel injection, disc brakes, more efficient. Uh, they became safer. And all of this by the fact that you had tested them by running them around on this track. And a village is sort of like that. In and of itself, it's insignificant. But when you can use it as an experimental vehicle, and that then finds its way into other things, eventually, as we'll see, into cities, um, uh, you begin to see why the villa becomes this vehicle for transformation, this experimental vehicle. But the second reason is where, all right, again, we've said the church, the church isn't going to buy, unless the, they want to burn it, uh, they're not going to buy a copy of Lucretius uh, on the nature of things, right? Uh, they're burning people at the stake who are actually followers of, of, of the philosophy of Epicurus. So why would, uh, who would buy these, these merchant princes? And where would they hire independent scholars who could read Arabic and read Latin and read Greek and read Hebrew and read all these ancient languages in the world? Huh? In the villa. So we have people like Lorenzo de' Medici establishing his Neoplatonic Academy at one of his villas outside of Florence, where he is hiring people away from um, the church, away from uh, universities were by and large controlled by the church for a long period of time, and he is employing them to put all of these classical texts back together. So the villa is important in two ways. One is it becomes, in a sense, a kind of academy based upon their interpretations of um, the Academy of Plato, for example, or the schools of Aristotle, for example, in which they're then kind of stitching these things back together. Now, what we have today, in most cases of these classical texts, has been stitched back together in this way. Um, so the villa is, is very important. And... Um, the, um, in the Renaissance, with the collapse of the Roman world, the villa as well as the forum had disappeared. And as we've seen, the medieval European city reverted to a centripetal pattern only to emerge with market functions after about 1100 A.D. And with this reversion, the concept of the villa as the embodiment of an idealized rural life ceased to exist. Likewise, the political organization of the feudal city with a powerful overlord had no room for political debate or public life in either the ancient Roman or the modern sense. As market functions returned and experiments with republican forms of government in Siena and Florence returned, the villa and the forum became the models for architectural experimentation embodying the vision of a new world built from incomplete and mostly imaginary evidence of a classical past. Yet this past, however fragmentary, served to fuel the imagination of the 1400s. Consider Alberti's introduction to Book 4 on public works in De Re Edificatoria. We shall consult, therefore, the experienced men of antiquity who founded republics and laid down laws to find out what they had to say. From this, Alberti quotes Plutarch on the divisions of society into those who laid down and interpreted divine and human law and those who work in the trades. So on. The lawgiver in Greece, in Athens, provides him with the place of the farmer and the artisan. Romulus and Numa Pompilius are cited as to the role of the military, the patrician, and the worker. Ancient Britons were divided, he tells us, into four divisions, as was Egypt. Hippodamus of Miletus gives us craftsmen, farmers, and combat troops, he says. He goes on. Aristotle seems to have favored selecting the most worthy of the common people to serve as counselors, magistrates, and judges. And using Diodorus, he tells us that ancient India was similar. From these ancient authorities, Alberti concludes that different buildings are appropriate for different natural divisions within society. He is, of course, trying to put forth an argument for the edification of the state through its buildings. But ancient authorities on buildings were scarce. Only Vitruvius had survived what Alberti describes as this vast shipwreck. I love this metaphor, um, this vast shipwreck. Imagine that you had never seen an ocean liner, a tanker, uh, uh, an aircraft carrier, right? You'd never seen one. The only thing you'd ever seen is a rowboat, and you're out rowing around fishing, right? 
and, and all of a sudden there's been a wreck of an ocean liner or something, a big cruise ship, and you see bits and pieces of it floating by, right? Seat cushions, um, part of the captain's table, uh, a banquette or something, luggage, and you're aware that whatever this thing was, uh, it was really big, right? But you don't know, because you've never seen one, you don't know how to put it all back together. So think of it like that, this vast shipwreck in which he is describing the ancient Mediterranean world. And so he says of Vitruvius that he was a man who wrote such that a Latin might think him Greek and a Greek might think him he babbled in Latin, so that for us it would have been best if he had written nothing at all. For Alberti, it was the material remains of the ancient world that provided the best teacher. Consider the introduction to Book 6. For I grieve that so many works of such brilliant writers had been destroyed by the hostility of time and man, and that almost the sole survivor of this vast shipwreck was Vitruvius, an author of unquestioned experience, the one whose writings have been so corrupted by time that there are many omissions and shortcomings. Examples of ancient temples and theaters have survived that may teach us as much as any professor. But I see, not without sorrow, these very buildings being despoiled each day. And anyone who happens to build nowadays draws his inspiration from inept modern nonsense rather than proven and much commended methods. Nobody would deny that as a result of all this, a whole section of our life and learning could disappear altogether. And so it is from this idealized and fragmentary evidence of a classical past from this vast shipwreck that was all around them, the modern world was born. So I want then just to go through and take a look at what it is they're looking at. What is the evidence? Um, this is the Noli map uh, of Rome, uh, which actually dates to 17, the middle of uh, the 1740s. Let me get this up in its proper position. And it looks like the wall, the red here, has slipped down of the old Aurelian wall. It's in 12 panels. And I, and I don't want to go through this in any, um, in any great detail, but um, remember that this is in the 18th century. And the point I'm trying to make is you can see how the city shrank. If you look here at, I don't get it. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Let me close this and start over. Sorry. Bring it back up again. Fortunately, it was the first slide. No, we don't want a timeout. We want this. <clears throat> Finally, um, <clears throat> it looks like this red line has slipped. I'll try to correct that, but <coughs> you can see the outline here of the Aurelian Wall. Now, Rome itself was much larger than the Aurelian Wall. Uh, just to orient you, this is the Palatine Hill, there's the Colosseum, the Esquiline Hill, Chilean Hill, and the site of the Circus Maximus. And you can see how Rome has shifted uh, to the north. Rome is still fairly small as late as 1748, and this map was, um, was made. <coughs> Again, this is just to orient you to the Aventine and the Palatine Hills. Uh, most of the city, even what was inside the Aurelian Wall, this is, I believe, the Porta Maggiore, um, is actually farmland, vineyards, vigno, orto. Um, it isn't actually, um, there we see the baths of Diocletian, which have been converted into a monastery and a church. And um, the, um, yet they were aware uh, that, in fact, uh, embedded within these buildings, in fact, what Giambattista Noli does when he makes this map, there's the Pantheon, that we see here, and you can see it has buildings encrusted in it, either in place names, Santa Sopra in Minerva, Sopra over Minerva, the Temple of Minerva. Um, we have the shapes of things like uh, the Piazza Navona, 
which is actually, of course, the uh, stadium of Domitian, which was used for foot races, a Greek, a Greek stadium. And there we see it today. And uh, some of you in here know, uh, in the 1930s, Mussolini peeled part of this away to expose the structure inside of these buildings of the old stadium. This is what I was talking about earlier. So imagine over time, Bobby Dodd Stadium has essentially become this, complete with a church, San Agnese and Agony, um, one of these merchant princes, I should do this, up at the top up here, uh, which is now the Brazilian embassy. And then um, if we sort of look uh, right over there, we see the Palazzo Pio, which is actually uh, embedded within that is the Theater of Pompey and the Temple of Venus Venetrix. Um, the fragments of the city still uh, was embedded within it. The uh, only intact building that survived was this building, uh, which is the oldest uh, continuously used building in the world that we know of. There may be some older that we know of, uh, which somehow survived through all of this because in part by about the ninth century, it was actually given as to the church by the Byzantine emperor who somehow was in control of this uh, because um, he wanted to protect it as an object of antiquity. Uh, this says Marcus Agrippa, son of Lucius, three-time consul, built this. And so it was converted to um, uh, Christian worship um, sometime around 800 uh, A.D. Um, it, there are actually notches in the columns where they hung partitions in the Middle Ages. Uh, they converted it into a fish market. Uh, so these, these fragments of things still remained. Um, in fact, the doors to the Pantheon are, in fact, original. And uh, when they were cleaning it, this is the Renaissance interpretation of it. That's the original that we see right there that was uncovered. Uh, I like this slide a lot because it shows, in fact, the portico of Octavia built by Augustus Caesar. You can see the pediment of that up at the top up here and then the column sticking up. And you can see how parts of this old Roman brick um, interior body of the building actually was converted into residential use. Uh, really <laughs> astonishing. Um, very little medieval material remains, but you, if you know what to look for, you can find it. Again, uh, down in the Jewish section of the city um, during the Middle Ages, you actually there's the portico of Octavia. Uh, part of it was converted into worship, uh, into congregational worship as a Christian church. And then we're up here, about halfway up the level of the columns. A fish market developed here as well. And then you can see if you dug down in the sidewalk, because we have these uh, columns that are sticking up out of the actual street. Um, this, the Via Biberatica in the markets of Trajan, uh, all peeled away by the archaeological investigations of the 1930s. But there we actually see a Renaissance loggia set down on top of a classical facade just plopped right on top of it. Um, totally different use, but, but actually extruded up from this uh, classical base. If we look at uh, the Theater of Pompey, one of my favorites, um, there we see uh, what is today <clears throat> Piazza Navona. There's the Pantheon. This is the Theater of Domitian, which no longer exists. And here we have the Theater of Pompey. I want you to pay attention to that corner that we see right there. This, this which is now owned by the University of Washington, um, is actually this building that we see right here. Um, it's still embedded within it. Um, some of you in the room are familiar with that. That's where you stay if you're interested in that Rome program I talked about, Rome and Greece. But this corner that you see right above the guy with the yellow bag, uh, if you look, is this corner that you see right here. Okay, That's where you are. So they were aware that they were encrusted in this when you made repairs to a building, uh, when you went down in the basement, when you, you would hit your head on some uh, piece of something. And they began um, to try to recover this in the same way that they began to try to recover these texts. Although they were not funded by the merchant princes. The merchant princes wanted the texts. Um, what the artists wanted was to find out how to make it. So they're actually digging stuff up. Now, um, we know that Brunelleschi... And uh, Donatello, good friends, actually went to Rome to dig. They were known as the treasure hunters. Uh, there we actually see the Theater of Pompey on the left. We see it as it fragmented up in the middle, and there we see an aerial photograph of the same thing today, and you can see it still embedded within the street pattern. And this is Lanciani's map 
from 1897, showing the same thing, photographs I took. Uh, the material, by the way, was pulled off of that and used to build the Palazzo Pio that you see on the right, as well as the Cancelleria and the Palazzo Spada that we see down uh, in the lower, the lower part. Now, imagine that you are a sculptor um, and you're living in 1380 and you go down to Rome, you start digging around and you, you find this, right? And you say, you know, I, we, we can't make that. This is better than anything we can do, right? So it plants in your mind that this vast shipwreck was some sort of like a race of superior beings or something, right? That it was, in fact, they were much, much better. And thus, they got anything they could, a torso, an arm, a leg, a head, anything uh, that was intact that they could then model themselves after, try to look and see how do we make these things. This little bronze, one of my favorites from Pompeii, little boy with a duck. These are the three sheets that you should read. So, <clears throat> Siena. We're just about out of time, so we will come back and, and, and deal with this uh, uh, the first thing on Wednesday. But before we break up, I want to show you this. That, it, it, you know, there, there's a tendency to think of, um, <clears throat> tendency to think of that um, somehow the, the so-called age of humanism arose and the church went into decline. That is not necessarily true. These things are operating side by side, um, although it questions the, the traditional forms of authority. This is a church, this is a cathedral church in Siena, and what you're seeing here is actually um, under construction. There you see the columns, column bases, under construction of what would have been the largest Christian building in the world, larger than St. Peter's. Uh, and it was under construction in 1348 when the bubonic plague hit Siena and construction came to a halt. And from that point on, Siena fell under the rule of the Florentines. Now, at the same time that they are building this church, they are building this, um, the Piazza del Campo, the Piazza of the Fields, and a city hall that we see here with a single tower, uh, which is divided up into nine divisions, like slices of a pie, each one symbolically representing one of the contrata in which each contrata had a representative on this town council in this experimental form of government. So while um, the church is certainly growing more powerful and has, in this case, an attempt to construct uh, the largest church in the entire Latin West, the, um, at the same time, they are building a new kind of space which we've not seen in the medieval world, which is, in fact, associated with city hall. That is, political space to create a forum. So we will leave it with that, and we will pick this back up on Wednesday. And I hope that what I've done <coughs> is to try to paint, as I said, to outline a kind of a picture or a portrait of what was going on in the background that motivates people to build what they built. Okay?